Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Isaac Castillo. My official title at the Latin American Youth Center, or LAYC is the acronym I'm going to use a lot, uh, is Director of Learning and Evaluation. Really, I lead a team at the organization that looks at the outcomes and the effectiveness of our, of our organization's work. Um, as the slide says, I'm here to talk to you about the past, present, and future of performance management in 20 minutes, no less. Um, <laughs> But before I get into any of that, I actually want to tell a story. First, a little background on the Latin American Youth Center. So LAYC is a large, multi-service, direct service nonprofit in the Washington, D.C. area. We also offer services in Montgomery and Prince George's counties, which are kind of the neighboring suburban counties around D.C. We offer 52 distinct service offerings or programs, so it's a lot. We do a lot of things. Our primary target population is 14 to 24-year-olds that are uh, at risk or severely at risk, and that live in neighborhoods that are predominantly Latino, predominantly made up of recent immigrants to the United States. One of the programs in particular that we offer um, offers residential housing services to youth that have aged out of the foster care system or that are currently homeless. So these are youth who haven't had a home for a long time. If they had a home, they were in foster families, they're likely cycling through. And because of their background, they tended to have juvenile justice involvement, so they'd been arrested for crimes. They tended to have substance abuse problems. They tended to have mental health issues and a whole other mix and myriad of problems associated with all of those things. A lot of times they're not in school. They're certainly not employed. Our residential programs try to get these youth into a safe housing situation and then to teach them independent living skills so that once they graduate from the program, they can then make it on their own successfully, they can get an education, they can obtain a job, and then they can live as happy and healthy individuals. That background is important because the story I want to tell you is about one of the residents in this particular program at LAYC. So this particular individual, he had a past where he'd bounced around the foster care system for about 10 or 11 years, living with about a dozen different foster families. He finally came to our program and we saw he had a whole host of issues related to him. The probably most significant is he'd recently committed a crime and was on probation. He was lucky to not get jailed, but he was on probation. He started to serve his few months at the organization within the residential program, started to do very well. As a condition of his probation, he had to have monthly meetings with his probation officer and with the sentencing judge just to make sure he hadn't relapsed and to started uh, engaging in negative behaviors again. One day, he was sitting and working with one of our staff at the residential programs, and he had a meeting with his probation officer that afternoon and the judge, and he asked our staff person, our LAYC staff person, he first made this comment, he made the comment of, I know that you track a lot of the interactions that we have, a lot of the discussion and have, and also the successes I achieve in this program, and you put it into a computer, and you put it into some sort of system. He didn't know it was ETO at the time, which we use, but he did know we track it. Then, and I think a moment of brilliance, and probably one of the most brilliant questions I've heard in my time working in the evaluation field, the youth stops and asks the staff person, can I have a copy of everything you have on me? Because I want to show that information to my PO and to the judge later this afternoon. In a second bit of, I think, brilliant thought, the staff person didn't hesitate, went to the screen, the review, the review participant effort screen in ETO, one of my favorites, <laughs> put in a date range of the last six months and printed out the entire list of everything that the student had done down to the minute and the outcomes and progression that the student achieved over the past six months, handed to the youth. The youth went to the PO and the, the, the presiding judge later that afternoon, and after a little training and coaching with, from the staff person to describe exactly what this information meant on this sheet, he gave a pretty sophisticated 15-minute presentation about everything he had done over the past six months and the outcomes he was able to achieve. I tell that story because I think that's the future of performance management. But before we talk future, let's go back to the past a little bit. So in my opinion, the past of performance management really can be summed up by one word, accountability. And even though this kind of philosophy still pervades a lot of the funders and a lot of the foundations, and in some instances, nonprofits right now, I do indeed believe in my heart it is the past. Reporting information to external groups just because they want it one specific way is really kind of the context of accountability. This all came out of the movement of the 60s and 70s and even continues today where there is an assumption by the funder that the nonprofits are not going to use the money in a very socially appropriate way. So they want to see how you spend every penny and most of the time they want to see if you're serving the correct service population. 
it doesn't really go any further than that, right? The data is not really used for program improvement. The funder is not really asking whether or not you have truly a long-term or even sometimes a short-term impact on the population you're serving. They really just want to know how the dollars are spent. Now, in and of itself, accountability, I think, is an okay thing. You want to capture this information in one, in one form or another, but you shouldn't stop at accountability. And that's the problem, I think, the nonprofit community and foundations and funders have been working under this mindset that in the 70s, 80s, 90s, continues in the 2000s, that it, everything stopped with accountability and no one asked about any additional data or any additional information. I know some of you are still living in this arena, still living in this atmosphere today, but I really, really am pushing you to understand that this way of doing things is truly the past. I think if we get to the present, I think it makes a little bit more sense and Kate uh, talked a little bit about this now. I think the present can be summed up in another single word, and that's improvement. Right now, I think where the performance management field is just starting to crest into is we are collecting information to really improve our programs. We are having dialogues with our funders to determine which particular types of information we need to collect, but we're doing it for the primary reason of serving our clients better. And that's why I think the current genre, the current uh, push in the nonprofit field is toward program improvement. And I think Kate's film does an excellent example showing what the current state of the field is and why this is so important. But I want to communicate one other quick story, one other message to you as to why I think this is vitally important. And I think David in his next presentation after the break is really gonna to talk to you about the ethical parts of why you need to be doing this. But let me have you consider this. Is any human being perfect? No, right? No program is perfect, no organization is perfect, no curriculum is, is perfect, no human being is perfect. Despite the best of intentions of everyone in this room, everyone watching this broadcast on the web, everyone out there in the nonprofit and the funding community, humans are fallible. Humans make mistakes. That means even if you have a research-tested curriculum, even if you have the best intentions, someone will make a mistake, and more than likely, someone somewhere is actually gonna cause harm to someone rather than doing good. And that's what the domestic violence story is all about, where you are causing, uh, causing unintended harm to your clients and participants. That spirit, I think, truly underlays the reasoning why we are looking at the crest of the movement now, talking program improvement. You, as nonprofit entities and funding organizations, really need to think about how we can improve our programming every single day so that the next day, the next week, the next cohort of people that come through our doors and receive our services are better served than they were yesterday. And that's all about program improvement and where we are right now. Now, the program improvement part of it, we're really kind of at the birth of this stage, and I think we're seeing more and more nonprofits move to this. But what I wanna actually talk about is where I think we're gonna be about 10 to 15 years from now, and that's the future. And that's what I'm calling empowerment. And I'd like you to go back to that story that I talked about earlier with our resident in the program. I truly think the future is not just collecting data and information so that we can improve programs for clients, but rather it's we're collecting data and information and sharing it with clients so that we can collaboratively, in partnership, make improvements of client outcomes with them. They are fully informed about what we're doing and they're taking a part, they are part and parcel about moving their own outcomes, moving their own needle to make better improvements in the future. That's really where I think we need to go with this. I really think that our databases, be they ETO or something else, need to be modified and thought of in a way that we not only collect information and have reports that are useful to us as program deliver, uh, delivery agents, but also we need to produce reports that we can physically hand to a service recipient, hand to a service client, and say, this is where you're at, this is where we hope to get you, here's the amount of, of service you've gotten, and six months from now, we're gonna give you another report that kind of summarizes this or even a month from now. And that way the client has an idea, they can look at this report and see how far they've gotten, and more importantly, how they need to get their act together to really achieve their own outcomes. That's why I think the future is about empowerment. That's why the future is really about engaging these clients and really getting them to understand the data, to understand the information that we're collecting on each of them. 20, 30, 40 years from now, this work that we're talking about was really kind of re uh, reserved for researchers, for statisticians, for evaluators. We've seen how over time the trend has moved, right? And now we as, as direct service providers, we understand the importance of this data. We understand that we can use this information to really modify our programs and to serve our clients better. 
we need to make the next evolutionary leap and understand and realize that our clients and our service our recipients, they're smart, they're sophisticated, they can understand this stuff if we present it to them in a way that they can easily comprehend. And that, my friends, I think is really the future. But let's not stop there. Because I think as both Robert and Kate really pointed out to us, we can't just stop at that future. What we have to do then is think about how does that future then really impact the way that we are going to do fundraising and how are we having dialogue with our donors. Because of the status of the economy and because a lot of the way that things have happened recently, we're going to need more and more donations, more than likely from private individuals or private citizens, and really focus on those types of, of individuals. As Robert pointed out earlier, I think we need to really frame our work in the context of does it make sense to someone who's making $49,000 a year as median income. In my opinion, I think that my future that I've laid out actually really speaks to this in a very good way. Because instead of just communicating, here's the work that we do, I think it's far more persuasive and far more interesting if I can tell the story of one of our residents and say that resident used their own information to really turn and change their own lives around. It's a sense of empowerment, it is not a sense of entitlement. We are in here as nonprofits helping to empower this individual to change their own lives, and that is why you should be making a donation to our organization. That, my friends, I think is the future. So my challenge to each and every one of you in this room, be you an evaluator, be you a funder, a foundation, a direct service person, or even just an individual donor, is to make the future happen. Thank you. I've got to make Kate's announcement after questions. So um, I'm going to start off with, with the, first, the first question, and then I'll, I'll uh, leave it up to, to the group. You, so you talk about this... this um, this change from accountability to performance management. What do you think is driving that change? Um, I, think, I think I have a, a head answer and a heart answer. So my head answer is telling us the reality of the situation that's driving this change, I think, is the economy and the funding situation. I think as more, as, as fewer and fewer dollars become available, it becomes more important for each of you as organizations to prove that your, your organization is effective and that you serve your clients very well. So you are trying to convince those that have the funds that you can deliver an excellent service and it has a good outcome for the participants, for the client base that you're serving. My hard answer is you're doing it because you want to serve your clients better. I, I, I know that that might not be the reality of the situation right now, but I think that that's truly what I believe in my heart as someone who's worked in the direct service field the way it should be. Um, so, so because I'm the MC, I'm gonna, I get to do some special things. Um, and so I'm going to tell you what, what I think. And I, I, I pretty much, <laughs> I, I more or less, I more or less a, a agree with Isaac. But I, I actually think that um, what we're starting to see is a change um, a, a movement away from the concept of charity, where you give somebody something and you don't expect anything in return, to social investing, where you're going to fund somebody and you're going to expect results. And I think one perfect example of this is the, um, is the interest in social impact bonds. And the, I think um, uh, the Obama administration call, refers to it as pay for success. Um, the, the, the days of taking money and not having to show that you can generate real social value, I think, are co quickly coming to an end. I, I would, I mean, I would agree. I certainly think, as as difficult it is for me to say this, and probably for a lot of you to hear it, because of the dwindling resources that are out there, the reality of the situation is is you are in competition with other nonprofits in your region and even nationally, and. If you're not able to get up and in some form of written or other form and say, here's why we serve our clients better than the next organization, it's going to be really difficult for you to continue to get funds as the amount of funds continue to dwindle. And I hate to say it, and I hate to put it in a competitive framework like that, but that's the reality of the situation. I would urge you to really kind of get on board with this, not be for the competitive reasons, but recognize that the competitive reasons are indeed there. And it's going to be very difficult for you to continue as a well-funded organization if you can't prove that you're more effective than the next organization. So when I mentioned earlier that there's an economic change that's taking place and some are going to benefit and some are going to have some, some issues 
it's organizations like LAYC that are going to benefit when we're taking, talking about a, uh, in a competitive situation. So let me open it up to, to some questions. Um, please ask your question into a mic. There's mics on, on the side. Um, let, me start, let me start back, back here on, the, on uh, the, my left. Hi. Um, I've heard a lot of talk today about, um, you know, programs and client outcomes within the program and getting young people to do well. But I think what I haven't heard um, in, the, in today, is, and I think is extremely important to think about, is that at the end of the day, we're all looking to improve our programs and to enhance the lives of the young people that we touch. And we can get young people looking good in our programs all day long. But the real test is when they leave our programs and if they're sustainable. And to be able to track the aftercare process and how they go back into the community and if they're able to hold down that job after they leave us, after services are complete. And if they're able to continue on in their education, if they're able to you know, have gainful employment and things like that. And so that is the real test and if we talk about success, real program success with our clients, it's actually when they leave our program and they're back into the community because if they are great in our community, then it improves the community as a whole. And that in itself is extremely successful. And with ETO, that can be tracked and that can be determined. And from that, we can then claim success. Um, go ahead. I do believe that individual donors and foundations and things like that seem to be moving forward. Government, not so much. And the first speaker spoke to the fact that government is still the largest funder of um, nonprofit organizations. In particular, our organization, almost all government funding. And we struggle to move from the past to the present, because the government is just now getting to the past. So I was wondering, what suggestions do you have to help move the whole organization when they're being held back when government is still asking for things the way they're asking for things? Right, okay, so, so two points to that. I think the first is, just because the government's stuck in the past doesn't mean your organization has to be. So I think what, what we do at our organization is we try to determine what information and data we want to collect for our own uses. 99% of the time that also includes whatever the government or whatever the past thinkers really want. On occasion it doesn't and we just kind of fold that in. But in our minds, the thing that always comes first is what information do we need to make our programs better. So it's, it's a mind shift at the, at the organizational level to really focus on let's get what we need and then we'll worry about what the funders need secondary. Now, the second answer to that and kind of the more probably specific piece of advice I have for you and anyone else in a similar position is um, I encourage you to have dialogues with your funders at off periods of time. And when I mean off periods of time, it's not when a grant is due or not when a report is due, but kind of in the middle. And I call these funder education sessions because really that's what they are where I sit down with the funder and I say, here are the things that you're asking us to collect. Here's what we are collecting as an organization. I, in my opinion, think that a lot of this stuff is far more interesting than what you're asking us to give you. How about if we give you this stuff? But in exchange for us giving you real true outcomes, GED placement rates, long-term employment retention data, and wage increases our participants over time, you need to do something to make that reporting easier on us. So if you're using an antiquated data system or one that is wasting a lot of our time, let's figure out a way to clean that up and we can get you information that's probably far more useful and interesting to you as a funder if you just work with us to make that happen. You can't have that conversation when you're writing the, the proposal. You can't have that conversation when you're writing the grant report and the report is due to, you know, in 24 hours. You need to have it at an off period of time because that's the only time they're going to listen. If you do it at one of those other times, they think that you're trying to game the system or get something out of, get out of something. You need to be very conscious to put something on your calendar that says, I'm going to approach my funder and do a little funder education during those off times and try to make the process where they're moving out of the past and more into the present, hopefully into the future. 
I'm not going to lie, it's not easy. We've been doing it at LAYC for probably about five years now, but there is hope. There are instances out there where you can change the funder's mindset and get them to really be on board with you to actually collect good outcome data and not just be trapped in the world of accountability. As you were talking, I was struck by some similarities as you talked about data and outcomes and sharing data with your participants. Uh, parallels to a lot of the discussion that's happening in the healthcare industry right mm -hmm. now. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious how much of that you've looked at and what kind of lessons you've taken away from it and what, what we could, might learn from that. Um, okay, so I'm going to throw a little um, background knowledge on me. I'm an evaluator by training. Um, please don't hate me. Uh, I did a lot of statistics work in grad school. Um, uh, yes, I think the answer is absolutely yes. We, we try to look at, and I think the field should look at, every industry out there that is collecting and using information in multiple different ways. So we've looked at how the healthcare system collects, system collects information and kind of uses that to track patient progress over time, be it from traditional paper pencil forms to the new me methods of electronic data uh, tracking that they utilize. We look at the private industry and look at, at what really sales numbers are doing or what sales software programs are doing or just organizations out there that track kind of their, their sales numbers and profit and, 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 and loss uh, revenues as well. Because really when you look at, look, you make sort of comparisons between traditional business and sales numbers and kind of service numbers, the outcomes are a little bit different, but you're still trying to count units of service and then the units of outcome and profit. So we look there as well. We look at um, other kind of uh, evaluators or, or the evaluation field to look at interesting new ways to collect data and information from our service population. So for example, there's a, a good trend going on now in the evaluation field where you're not doing pre and post tests all the time, but some they're called reflexive or retrospective pre and post tests, where you give the pre and the post at the end, so you're not doing a traditional pre and post test. Now, there, there are some differences in validity and reliability, but oftentimes it gets made up for the fact by your impressions when you start a program as a participant are often are very drastically different than when they are at the end of a program. And by doing this data collection in a different way, it, puts, it allows the, the service recipient to be in a single mindset rather than being in two different mindsets at the beginning of a program and the end of a program. We try to look as much as possible to stay on the, uh, the cutting edge of all of the data collection and all of the instrument design uh, fields so that we can really find the best way to track this information. And then, more importantly, we also look at all of the, the information out there on how to present this data back in a bunch of different ways. So we look at data visualization methods and, and, and classes and a lot of text out there to show you know, it's not just okay to present a pie chart anymore. Perhaps you need to do more sophisticated presentations of your data. Sometimes you're using slides, sometimes you're not. Sometimes you need to be careful with your language. Sometimes a picture really does say a thousand words. So we kind of incorporate all of that with the intent of serving our clients better by better understanding our programming data, but also, as we talked about earlier, educating our funders as well. Because the funders learn things different ways as well. And sometimes they'll get it by hearing me speak, Sometimes they'll get it by having one of my staff hand them a one uh, sheet page with a really well done graph on it. So look at as much as you can. Sure, uh, yeah, you've got the mic. Okay, so I'm still putting together my question, so I hope that it's clear. Um, since we're talking about the future, you mentioned several times kind of how you envision it, and I wonder if you kind of see it as a double-edged sword at all, that nonprofits are now being told to behave like businesses, and even the language is changing, right? So instead of having clients, now we have consumers. Instead of having services, now we have a product. Um, and I'm just wondering if you kind of foresee any problems with that kind of moving forward um, once clients become consume, uh, consumers. And like even the language around that, yeah. but then actually how it is working in practice, it seems kind of like the nonprofit field is embracing that, and I'm wondering just what your thoughts are about that and whether you feel like it's problematic. I think that's a really interesting question that a lot of people probably have had kind of, you know, plugging around in their minds but really haven't kind of faced yet. I, and I think the answer to this is it depends. I think it's incumbent on all of us as direct service providers to understand that that's the movement afoot, but not to necessarily change our messaging and our actual service delivery with the clients. So in many ways, you have to learn to speak multiple different languages. You have to maintain your current language and your current interactions 
with your clients, with your service recipients, and make sure none of that changes in their minds. They feel as valued individuals who are getting an important service to you, but if this trend continues over time and there's a switch in language to the more of the business language, we all, as, as members of the nonprofit industry, learn to, need to learn to speak that language as well so that when we're removed from the clients, we can go into the people thinking about the business world and say, okay, they're no longer clients, they're consumers. And we're talking about profit margins in the context of, of outcomes. And we can have, learn to have this dialogue, but at the same time, it is a little bit separate from what's going on with the direct interaction with the youth. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be challenging. It will be like learning a new language. And I think all of us are gonna be faced with having to do that. But it's, I think it's a very real and legitimate fear, and I'm glad you brought it up. But I think, again, the challenge to, to, to this group is to understand there's gonna be a lot more expected of us in the future. There's gonna be a lot more that we're gonna be asked to do, and one of these things is learning to potentially speak a different language, a language that's more business focused, and learning how to compartmentalize that, speak it with the appropriate individuals, and then leave that mindset, and then when we're working back with clients again, to be engaged in our usual language that we're more comfortable with to make sure that we stay on message with the client. I, I found it interesting, uh, the evolution of performance management from accountability to improvement to empowerment. And I was just curious, based on the, the story you told, uh, has your organization uh, really engaged uh, the youth or client in that way in terms of transparency or sharing the data? We're, we're trying. I'm not, uh, by no means I'm going to say we figured this out. I mean, we're, we're at the very beginning of the empowerment curve, and I think there's a number of other organizations that are at this conference that are kind of at the beginning of this. Uh, you know, so we have some work to do. There are some programs where I think we're very comfortable with, uh, with the way ETO is set up and how it's articulated on certain screens that we can produce those reports for those clients. We've got another pro a set of programs where we just haven't figured out the best way to communicate what it is we're doing, the outcomes, and getting that in a way to the, to the service recipients in a way that's easily understandable. So we're, we're part of this journey just as everyone else. Have you found uh, the client's engagement, that commitment to change, strengthened by the transparency in the journey? Absolutely. I think, I think the important part, there's two important parts of it. The first is the consent process at the beginning. So you need to make clear at the very beginning when you're serving a client for the first time, they're filling out all your paperwork, that you are collecting a sort, some information on them and it's getting stored, in our example, in ETO, so that they're well aware of it at the beginning and they're willing to, you know, they're able to, it is within their right to ask for that information as long as there aren't confidential parts about it and you can kick that information back to them. Kicking it back to them though is completely different than giving it to them and helping them understand or interpret that information, which is the second critical part about this. So they need to be made aware during the consent process, and then when you do share it, you're not just handing them a piece of paper, but you're walking through the process of what this outcome means, what this point of service element means, what this attendance rate means, so that they have a, an understanding of really what's going on on that form or on that report that you're giving them. Once that happens, though, the few kind of dozens of youth that kind of have started this process with us, their engagement kind of shoots through the roof because I think they get it. They understand now that they're not just a person that's just getting services, but really we're in there to help them change their lives and we're putting in all sorts of effort into them. I mean, oftentimes the clients don't realize that, that if they're interacting with five or six different staff in the same program, each one of those staff are putting in all those interactions into ETO. When the clients see that and see literally the hundreds of hours of work that we put into them, and they understand that they have gone from you know, this place to this place in an outcome, but potentially regressed from this place to this place, they have a better understanding of that they need to take more responsibility on themselves to really tear in their lives around. Because it's one thing for youth to kind of just sit there and get services, it's quite another for them to understand I'm part of this process, and it's partly on me to really help achieve these outcomes over the short and the long term. Question in the back. Hi. I, I'm struggling a little bit um, with the... Um, the consumer versus uh, client, and the you know the, the business nonprofit dichotomy, um, and and I think it also relates to um, 
to what you were just, to, to the third category of empowerment. Um, I'd like to see the empowerment be not just empowering the individual, but empowering organizations to say, here's what we do. So it isn't just, you know, accountability was of the past, improvement is how we make ourselves better, but empowerment is actually telling our story, which I think our first speaker re related to, that we provide jobs that for the most part, nonprofits are incredibly well managed and do a tremendous amount with very little. Um, and that empowerment, I think we can add that another, uh, another layer to that of putting ourselves forward as, as models of good management, as models of good business, if you will. And rather than, you know, when you talk about the language dichotomy, I, I know we all have to speak many different languages to many different fun funding sources, um, but I think there's an education, you know, like you talked about the education moment with funders, there's an education moment in the business community um, where, that where that dialogue can really be, um, could be in the future, if we were really more empowered with data, right. could be more of a dialogue. Um, and I think nonprofits, many nonprofits, I'm going to guess your nonprofit, um, has a lot to teach, even the business community, on good management. Oh, I, I totally 100% agree with you, and I think the, the story I'd like to tell about that is, um, you know, as probably a lot of, of your organizations, on our board of directors, we have people from the business community, and you should see kind of this deer in headlights look where I have to explain to them uh, how it is we measure whether or not our programming is effective or not, because they're used to thinking really of just one thing, are we making a profit or not, and thinking of measuring it in dollars. When you have an organization that has 50 plus, you know, different service uh, programs that each are delivering uh, different types of services, we've got 50, you know, close to 60 different outcomes at the very micro level. I have to explain to the business community that measuring a job, well, we have to define what the job is and what counts as a job. Is it a, is it a part time or is it a full time job? Is completely different than someone getting a GED. Is completely different than someone improving their report card grades and having to educate the, the business community about what it truly means to measure the success of a program or an organization is in many, many respects much more difficult than doing it in the private sector. So I, I totally agree with you. I think the more experience we get at doing this, the more data that we have to back up kind of our, our observations and what we're doing, the more empowered we will be as staff people to tell our elevator speeches and to be able to inform the business community as well. One more question. Hi. Um, this could be implied or gathered by a lot of funders or for those organizations who are funded by local government, federal even. But has have any of the organizations here ever tried to attribute cost savings to, you know, are you doing that and, and are you doing that with ETO software? Because from where I sit, that seems like a little bit more of an esoteric thing to me, mm -hmm. but um, perhaps it's also within our reach and that's something that we could be doing. I think the, the key question about, so the short answer to your question is yes, and I would encourage people to start thinking about costs, but I, again, this is another one of those instances where the language is very important because what you want to stay away from situations are where local governments or other funders are just gonna always fund the cheapest. You want, to, you want them to fund the most efficient. So the example I give to you is, do you want an organization that serves a, a youth for $1,000 a year, but doesn't get any real measurable outcomes for them, or would you want to fund an organization that yeah, it costs $10,000 a year to fund this youth, but they actually make sure that that is a youth who is dropped out of school and they re-engage them in school and get them a high school diploma? That's the kind of language and that's the kind of scenarios you need to prevent present to your your local funding entities because you want to get them away from the accountability mindset of just going for cheap to, to just looking at overhead costs and who has the minimal overhead and more to who is making the best expenditure of dollars to get the largest outcome the largest bang for your buck did you have a follow-up point to that I think you might have okay but, um, that's also I mean, I think it's important to do this cost-benefit analysis included, and the way that we're doing it now, kind of the next thing we're pushing towards is we're not measuring cost per participant in the near future, we're measuring cost for outcome. So we don't want to tell you as a funder it costs you to get, uh, it costs you $1,000 for a GED preparation slot, but rather we want to say it's going to cost you $10,000 to get someone who's dropped out of school to ensure that they actually get a GED. It, and it can also be like, 
funds that the city saves in yeah, incarceration. Yeah, absolutely, and return on investment, social yeah, return on investment, exactly. That's which we also do I'm as well, about. right? Because again, I think, uh, I think certainly to what Robert was speaking with, if, if you make these investments early on, you end up making long-term savings to right, your local right, government right. community. So we do that as well. As we look at some, what some work some economists have done with our target population and say, if we get a youth to, to, to not drop out of school or we get someone to reduce their substance use level so they're no longer an abuser, there are much bigger long-term cost savings and, you know, going down the road so that you as a local government entity, if you fund us at this amount now, you really are saving those dollars in the, in the future. Right. right. Um, That's what's most inter interesting to me and yeah, at my company. I, I think, yeah. again, it's, part of it is the language and how you describe it, right? You need to be able to become versed in that literature, understand what some of those economists are talking about, and then be able to marry that with what you're doing as a program so that you can make a very articulate case as to why your program is indeed saving money in the long term. If you can get access to that data, then absolutely do it. Okay, last question. Just, it's a comment on the cost sure. savings. And something that I think about often with cost savings is if I can go back and look at the government 20 years ago and look at the arguments that were being made then about telling the politicians or the government entities at that point, the cost savings if you do this today in 20 years will be such that we can, let's backtrack and see. Because I mean, the, the issue is social issues have been a part of our human history and they will continue to be. Sometimes I think we get lost in this idea of cost saving because we can go to the future and sort of say, you know, when we talk about, especially around juvenile systems today, uh, oh, the cost savings if we do this for kids today will be, you know, a billion dollars in 20 years from now. Um, I would like to see those arguments from the 80s and, and so forth and to see if we're actually experiencing cost savings because of the, uh, the initiatives that we had you know, 20 years ago. Because then you can say, you know, we need to continue to do this because the, the, the cost savings that we proposed in the 80s are actually, you know, being um, enjoyed now. And so right. that's an argument for saying that the cost savings we're going to propose now, you know, in 20 years time we'll be able to say Yeah, I, I'm with you. And I think, I think doing that sort of counterfactual analysis is important. But I do want to put one more piece of information out there for everyone to think about, is this should be one, uh, one tool that you have in your toolbox to talk about your programs and to get funding. Because when we're talking about you know, 20 year time frames, well, most politicians aren't worried about what's going to happen 20 years from now. They're just worried about this current election cycle. So you need to be able to talk about what's important in six months, what's important in a year, what's important at the next election date, and then what's important 20 years from now. Because different things are going to be persuasive to different people. But I, you know, as someone who has, you know, economics training, that totally is persuasive to me. It not be, might not be persuasive to a typical local government foundation or foundation person. Okay, okay. Uh, one more comment, or two, two more comments or questions. It's, these are the speakers, so. Yeah. Just real quick, if you want to get really interested about the future, what we're talking about is, if in 1986, you gave Bill Gates $1,000, you have a half a million dollars in the bank today. But if you gave Muhammad Yunus, who, de who developed the Grameen Bank, you know, that has elevated almost 100 million people, primarily women out of poverty with small loans, all you got was a one-time tax deduction. What we're talking about is the inevitable ability somewhere down the road to be able to get an annual and increasing tax deduction with, based on the same rate of return principle as a dividend check if a nonprofit organization can show verifiable, measurable return. The ability of these measurement tools eventually, if you elect the right people, will initiate policies in which investing in Baltimore can make you wealthy. That's the future. So, so I want to take a contrarian position. Um, I don't believe anything I've ever heard about any statements about monetized social return on investment. Um, and uh, when I was working at a, a foundation, I uh, called together the leading academics in America who'd made their professional careers on monetizing social return. Uh, because we were trying to figure out whether we should do like Robin Hood and some other organizations uh, invest on monetized social return on investment. And I offered them the promise of never revealing who had participated, never revealing who had said what, offered them complete anonymity, and all I asked is the president of our foundation to sit and listen. 
and we, they talked for um, uh, a whole day with each other, and each of them had to admit under questioning by the others that they could not justify their basic assumptions that they put into their formulas for calculating social return on investment. So if any, anything that you say about, well, if we get a person off drugs, or if we get a person not into prison, all of that, if you only look at the things you want to look at, you will get your social return on investment. But if you, don't, if you, if you look at the person's whole life, maybe fathering uh, a, 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 a child with a teenage woman and then not assuming responsible parenthood, if, if you don't look at that, then you don't realize this person has been become a tremendous liability on society and you're, just, and you're still just looking at the fact that he's not being a criminal. So I just want to say I think that monetized social return on investment is exactly the wrong way to go. The foundation I worked at then did not go that way. We went instead on measurable outcomes. And to the credit of the person who spoke before, I think it was you, young lady, um, it's long-term outcomes that really matter. And um, if you have short-term and intermediate uh, outcomes that predict good long-term outcomes, they're good to, to work towards, like, for instance, completing a certain amount of post-secondary education tends to put you in line for being employed, non-criminal, happy, and productive. Um, so I really don't think that the cost-benefit analysis is the way to go in the nonprofit sector, and I would urge you to push back against the funders who are trying to impose that on you. Thank you, Isaac. Can I do Kate's announcement? Oh, great. One more thing. Okay. Um, I do have a quick announcement. For those of you in kind of the, the greater Washington, D.C. area, on December 14th, there will be a workshop called Resources to Results Roadshow, which will be a half-day workshop, which will be talk about three things. The first is we'll have a, another quick viewing uh, of the Saving Philanthropy film, and Kate Robinson will be there to answer questions. The second is we'll have a presentation of the Outcomes and Effective Practices Portal, which was done by a group of organizations to help develop instruments to help you measure uh, different uh, facets of your work. And there will be a demonstration of that, uh, of that portal. And the final thing is that uh, Steve Butts, the, uh, the returning president of Social Solutions and I, uh, will be doing a, a demonstration on how you can use data to better inform your programming and to really do a practical hands-on example. All of that information is available at www.savingphilanthropy.org slash workshop for information on that particular workshop. Come to me or come see Kate if you want additional information. Thank you very much. <laughs>